Sure. Welcome to Turn Files. I'm Jamie Young, and today I am glad to have Assemblyman Billy Jones on. Thank you for being on, Billy. It's great to be here, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just to start off with, um, even though some people around the area are aware of this, you originally started off as a corrections officer. Sure, yeah, I grew up on a, a small dairy farm, a small family dairy farm in Chattagay, and um, actually ran the dairy farm for a, for a few years after high school, and then uh, went into the Department of Corrections for uh, a number of years, and then, um, you know, I was, I was always interested in politics, always interested in uh, getting involved in my community. So in 2009, uh, the former mayor and a, and a counselor of, uh, or a trustee of the village of Chattagay asked me to run for mayor. Um, and I was elected and served two terms as mayor and then also uh, Franklin County legislator. Uh, mm -hmm. I did two terms there, two three-year terms, uh, six years, and served as chair of that board for uh, four years. And then in 2016, ran for uh, this office and was successful. And um, I'm in my second term right now in my fourth year. Yeah. And uh, from what I can tell, you're running unopposed this time again. Yes, I am. I'm uh, uh, but. Uh, I guess it's, it is, it's fortunate. And um, I like to think that uh, um, all the hard work that not only myself, but my staff um, has put into this job, we, we have, we've worked extremely hard the last uh, three and a half plus years. And, um, uh, you know, I have to give uh, credit where credit is due. I've had mm -hmm. some great people that have worked for me and um, they have served the community well. And uh, just, uh, you know, I think it's a testament to all the hard work that we've put in. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, past legislative season didn't end quite the way that you were hoping for, given the uh, pandemic. <laughs> yes, yes. It um, is certainly, you know, I think it goes without mentioning, obviously, the, the year that we're going through, right. the trying times that we're going through. And certainly um, this year, um, as with everyone, almost everyone, I, I, I can't think of anybody that has not been affected by, by this pandemic. Um, you know, we, we started out the year, um, you know, on schedule with uh, legislative items that we were going to take up. And then uh, March hit us, uh, uh, hit us all right between the, uh, right between the eyes actually. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, things have not been the same since I, I, like I said, that's, that's an understatement, um, in these unprecedented times, but, um, we got done kind of around mid March. We, we, you know, we were following safety protocols and when, when New York, um, shut down, um, it was at the beginning of mid March, um, that uh, we, we basically went home to, to help stop the spread and help get back in our communities to help our community members out. And then um, we went back at the end of March to do the budget uh, for, uh, you know, for that week, uh, budget week. And then um, all of April, most of May, we weren't there. We went back in the end of May. We've been back probably three or four times um, since then. Um, to take care of uh, COVID related issues and, 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 and other legislative issues that were important to our areas. But, um, you know, it's been a, <laughs> it's been a whirlwind of a year um, for everyone and, and, you know, much like it for the legislature. But that's not to say that we haven't been working hard. I will say, and uh, just touching, touching on a few uh, topics, when, um, when, when, when all the businesses shut down, um, you know, my staff, we were instrumental in, in helping people get unemployment benefits. Um, probably a volume of calls and emails, like uh, certainly like I have never seen, probably, um, and it was the same way all across to the state with all of my colleagues, um, the volume of calls and emails in, um, you know, on that issue, trying to help people get connected with the Department of Labor. Um, we all know about the issues that they were having, um, you know, 
so we, we, I thought we did a, a, a fantastic job um, getting people connected with their unemployment benefits. We were talking to people that, that hadn't uh, received a check or hadn't received those benefits for sometimes in the neighborhood of four or five, six, seven, eight weeks, which, yeah. uh, you know, people just, just were, yeah. were desperate. And that, and that puts a crimp into everybody's budget. Yes, certainly, certainly. So we helped a lot of people out. We, we tried to help everyone we could. I know people got frustrated with it, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm proud of what, uh, what we did there. Um, we, we had our backs against the walls. My staff worked, um, you know, overtime to, to get people uh, those benefits and to help them with the PUA um, mm -hmm. benefits as well, the, the federal stimulus uh, uh, money. Um, and, um, you know, those were just some of the issues. Obviously, businesses were hurting, shut down. We tried to help them um, get uh, some kind of relief and work with our federal partners to do that. So it was a very, very trying time. Um, um, you know, we, we worked remotely, I would say probably for a month and a half, two months. And then we started slowly coming back into the office doing shifts. We obviously wanted to, you know, the, the safety of, of, of my staff is, is of utmost importance to me. So we, we started doing, you know, um, shifts in and out of the office. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're certainly, we were working throughout this whole uh, pandemic and throughout everything uh, remotely, probably, uh, probably harder than, than, then we would work in uh, quote unquote normal times, honestly. Yeah. On the um, overall state economy as it stands now and going forward, seeing that currently within Congress, the next CARES Act is being held up over money, um, but also other things are tied into that given that situation if the federal government does not step in to help any of the states out financially what is albany preparing to do well first of all let me say jamie and and, and you stated it correctly um we need, we need, and I can't under, uh, I can't uh, overstate this enough. We desperately need a federal stimulus package, not only for New York, other states need it as well. But uh, as you know, New York was hit um, the hardest at this in the beginning of this, um, you know, uh, this, this horrible virus um, took the lives of many people and it, and it shut down our economy. Um, and it shut down uh, basically our, our, our lives for a number of months. And when you do that, you devastate an economy, not only the cost of the, you know, the, the health care that, that New York State put, put forward, um, but as well as, uh, you know, the, the revenue that we did not receive. We're talking in the billions and billions of dollars. I cannot, um, I cannot state enough. We need federal stimulus package without state and local aid in a federal stimulus package, and I'm talking a significant amount, um, we're going to see programs and jobs cut in education, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the pro, uh, veterans programs, infrastructure, um, all the things, uh, so our social programs, uh, substance use, mental health, all these very important child care, all these very important um, life-changing um, you know, issues that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, everyone is going to be affected by this. And um, we've heard of the cuts coming from New York um, as far, you know, as far as to our localities and to organizations that depend on that funding, anywhere from the neighborhood of 20 to 35%. That will be devastating for, um, for everyone. Albany, we have, we have talked about uh, another, uh, uh, a number of revenue raisers, anywhere from uh, legalization of gambling to um, raising money on, um, on billionaires or raising taxes or re uh, a way to get revenue um, from billionaires. So there's a lot of issues that are being um, uh, a lot of revenue raisers and a lot of areas that we're looking at to do that. 
Um, we're, you know, in constant contact with our leaders to see where we're going with that. But we will go back into session um, to deal with that. Uh, but like I said, I can't state enough how much we need, uh, we need our, our, our federal leaders, our federal partners to step up, um, stop the petty uh, nonsense and BS and mm -hmm. get, this, um, get this state and local aid um, to, our, to our states and our municipalities. We need it. There's, there's, there's no way. Our, our public safety, our public welfare um, depends on it. Mm -hmm. um, still on, and you, point, you mentioned the thing with um, cuts to schools and all that. Um, on August 13th, you put out a statement my office continues to field dozens of phone calls and emails from concerned parents and educators regarding our region's readiness to reopen schools. Where are we right now at that, at that to actually, for parents like yourself, to fill very comfortable to allow their kids to go back to school uh, you know i don't think uh, you know as a parent and and knowing uh, my our communities and, and many parents i don't know as if we're at a level where we can say you know we feel 100 percent comfortable um, mm -hmm. because i don't think anybody feels 100 percent comfortable right now i think our school districts have worked hard. I really do. I've, I've worked with the administrators. I've worked with um, the teachers uh, to connect them with the local health department to try to get them all the answers that, that we can and uh, to help get resources to them. Um, I do believe that the state should be doing more to get them the resources um, that they need as far as PPP and or PPE, I should say, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, you know, sanitizing and, and better communication with the New York State DOH and the in the school districts. I've been a proponent of that, trying to push them towards that. Um, so like I said, I think um, I would hope that we are, you can never say, uh, you know, we're 100% um, ready because this virus knows no, you know, knows no boundaries. But I, I can feel, I, I feel confident that our school districts, our local health departments, everybody is doing everything we can um, to prepare us for um, sending our children back to school. Um, a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, school districts have delayed a, a little bit. Um, some are doing uh, online le learning. Um, we have hybrid programs out there, um, you know, two days in school, three days out, uh, a lot of high school, uh, Kids will be doing that to to uh, make the social distancing, uh, you know, uh, better in these in these um, in these buildings. It's just going to be, and I mentioned it, I mentioned it a month ago, two months ago, um, and I've mentioned it every single day. This probably will be our biggest hurdle here in the North Country, getting our children back, getting getting our parents and getting our teachers and getting our faculty to a comfort level where um, they all feel comfortable and and there are some there are some parents and there are some uh, students that are that are they don't feel comfortable going back and, and they're not um, I've heard of you know some percentages from a few school districts um, but I just think we're all working together or I know we're all working together uh, to to make this uh, as safe as possible for for our students, and uh, it's 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 a real uh, it's a real heavy lift, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, um, we won't see um, you know uh, the, the breakouts in, in in any of our schools that we do. But in that case, um, you know, I'm confident in our in our health departments and in our uh, in our faculties that uh, in our school administrators uh, that they will. Uh, they will take the steps necessary um, to contain that as quick as as possible. Yeah. Um, you also said, if, you can correct me if I'm wrong, sure. the um, 
committee for uh, farms and yep. I, agriculture. agriculture. Yep. Yeah. Um, recently, there's been reporting that, um, and this is in heavily agricultural states. Sure. Um, when it comes to dairy and soybeans and all that about and the lack of what we would consider to be a trade deal and also the overall effects of the pandemic and the understanding that the PPE program didn't really help out the small farmers. Have you heard of any issue from our local farmers in the area on any of that? Yes. First, you know, first of all, our, our farmers are, are, uh, have taken a tremendous hit um, in their businesses during um, this pandemic, um, in particular dairy farming as well. They were just climbing out of a, out of a hole um, where low prices and, uh, uh, you know, other factors were hurting them. We were starting to see a little light at the end of the tunnel and then the pandemic hit. And um, painfully, we saw farmers actually dumping milk, um, thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of gallons of milk, um, which, uh, you know, is really heartbreaking because we know all the, the hard work that they did to put that in. Uh, you know, um, you know, you can't just close the doors and, and not uh, tend the crops or tend the animals. It's just, you know, it's a 24-7 job. Um, I would say I did have farmers reach out to me as far as um, getting help with the PPP. Um, the federal government opened that program up a little more to include farmers. And um, we put them in contact with, um, uh, you know, uh, the small business organizations and um, our federal partners to help them out in, uh, in any way we could. Um, and we will continue to do that. I do believe in the federal stimulus package. Um, whenever we see that come out, mm -hmm. that um, we need more help for our agricultural industry in that. Um, we certainly do, uh, along with so many other issues. But I would, I would be hard, uh, I would press hard uh, and have pressed hard to see that we uh, have that, uh, have more money in there for our, for our businesses. Uh, because agriculture is a, it's, it's the, you know, the lifeblood of our, our, of our communities in a lot of aspects. And, uh, you know, they are small businesses, but a lot of them are um, family run, family owned um, businesses that have been in, uh, in those families for generations and generations. And it's their life. It's not only a business, it's their life. And they put food on our tables and they, and they take tremendous pride in that. And uh, we really need to help them out and help them be as successful as possible. I know from being a farmer that it's, it's hard work and um, a lot of it um, is out of your control as far as the pricing amounts that you, that you, that you receive. So um, we certainly need to help them out and especially during this pandemic. Yeah, that's something that I have an understanding of because my grandfather on my mother's side of the family, he had a small dairy farm down in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Loved the place. <laughs> Absolutely loved the place as a kid. <laughs> but um, on, and, I, and this kind of ties in together. Um, over you can say the past several decades, um, we've been um, seeing a change in our climate around here. Um, and lately, I've noticed, along with others in my family, that the summers around here tend to feel more like the summers in the Midwest the heat and humidity. Um, what is the state trying to do to try and combat climate change in its own way? Sure, sure. Um, last year, actually, we had a remarkable session in, in passing 
um, several uh, pieces of legislation that um, I believe New York is probably one of, or if not the most aggressive state in doing this. We, we passed the Climate Control Act. Um, that is a, you know, a, a, a huge um, a piece of legislation that affects uh, a lot of areas that we hope will help uh, combat climate change. Um, there are other pieces of legislation out there um, that we are we are uh, tackling to do that as well. Um, but we're also, you know, renewable energy. I think New York is probably one of the, or it is, I know it is one of the leaders in investing in renewables, mm -hmm. um, renewable energy, um, which, um, which our area has seen as well. Um, so I think there are many things that we are doing um, here in New York. Um, and I think that uh, residents here can be proud of um, to combat climate change. But I would also say this needs to be, you know, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the climate doesn't necessarily depend on uh, uh, state borders or international borders. Um, right. As, as you well know. And, um, you know, I think this, this is a larger issue, not, not saying it's not an important issue for New York State to, to do. And I'm very proud of what, what we're doing and what we have done and, and certainly will continue to do. Um, but I think this needs to be a federal uh, issue. I think it needs to, uh, you know, to be tackled there. Also a North American and let's face it, a global, uh, global issue. Um, because like I said, um, you know, we were affected here in the North country. Um, if you'll remember a number of years ago, in particular in the North country and in the Adirondacks, um, you know, with acid rain back in the eighties in early oh, yeah. night. And um, where, where did that come from? It came from the Midwest. Um, plants in the Midwest that we, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hammering on the Midwest, love the Midwest right. as well, but it came from plants in the Midwest, actually, um, from the pollution runoff from, from large manufacturers out there um, that produce acid rain. So it's, it's tough to tackle on a state by state basis. I think we should be doing it, but certainly this needs to be a, a federal and a global uh, uh, issue, and we need to combat it that way as well. So you would be all in support of the U.S. getting back into the Paris Accords? Sure. Yes. Um, this past, um, uh, walking back a little bit here, this uh, past legislative season, there was two pieces of legislation um, that was put forth. Um, one of them is, uh, is called Repeal 50A, which is to remove the longstanding exemption to, for police departments to withhold evaluations of officers who come under suspicion of abuse of authority. Um, I didn't check to see if it was voted on or not. Um, where is that standing right now? It was voted on and, and passed, uh, Jamie. Um, the governor um, signed that piece of legislation. I had some issues with that legislation, um, actually. Um, I think we should, you know, um, hold our police departments accountable um, when that's necessary. But I would say that um, the piece of legislation that I, I found uh, uh, a little, you know, it was uh, a little troubling in that was that unsubstantiated claims um, could be put in your, in your jacket. Um, everybody says, well, they can remove them, but those unsubstantiated claims, and certainly if, un if substantiated claims are, are, um, uh, are, are put in your jacket. They're foilable. That should happen. Um, you know, that, that can, uh, you know, uh, be part of a, a police officer's record, but these unsubstantiated claims, um, were also part of it too. That means, um, I could say whatever I want, um, about, uh, Jamie Young, and that can be put in your, in your jacket, mm -hmm. in your file. And, um, then I have to fight to get that out, no matter how ludicrous that, that claim may be. I think that muddied up the waters. I, I had an issue with that. Um, 
So it did pass. The governor did uh, did sign it into law back in end of May, early June, I believe it was. So, so that little piece of that legislation is still there. Yes. Yes. Would you be able to somehow have that amended so where that is taken out? I think it should be, but I mean that, you know, legislation does get changed. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we'll have to see going forward in this. I do know that um, there, um, there are groups, um, I don't even think they're in uh, New York State, one of them that um, they have um, foiled the records of every police department in New York state and uh, foiled their records for the past 50 some odd years um so um it's uh, you know we have a lot of these uh, smaller police departments going through their records right now um trying to meet some of these foilable obligations but um we never know legislation does change um as you know it changes from time to time and um we'll see where where this uh, where this ends up uh, the other piece of legislation and this is something that um Kelly Metzner and I talked about when I had her on uh, the walking wall trans from what she said it came to the floor of the assembly but it wasn't voted on um, I don't believe it ever got to the floor I don't know where that bill is in particular um, but I don't if I can I don't recall it, that it got to the floor. I think it's still in committee. I could check on that for you. Um, but I, I don't know if it got to the floor yet, Jamie. I'm not, I, I, it, it didn't, I did not see it read. You know how they, they have bills on, on the floor, actually physically on the floor. And um, we have calendars that we go through. And sometimes a bill will be set aside to, to debate it later or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I know, I don't believe that bill got to the floor, but I can certainly check to see. I, I believe it was in committee the last I knew, but I can check to see where that is. I, I know that there's um, the Senate version, which is Senate number uh, S2253. And even that, I have no clue on. So mm -hmm. I, I can check that out to see where exactly it is. Um, um, for you and, and get back to you with that information and, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I can reach out to Kelly as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, recently, and this is a report out of Rochester about uh, what happened to Daniel Pruitt back in March. Um, and I know this is completely out of our region, but um, your feelings on how the officers should have dealt with that incident. Is this the, I'm not, I, I don't mean to be ignorant here. Is this the one that was just in the news last right. night or today? Last, last night and today. Yeah, excuse my ignorance. I don't know a lot about what happened. I saw the, if you'll, uh, I, I will certainly look into it. I don't know a lot about what happened. I actually saw the headlines. I watched the Today Show every morning. I saw the headlines on that this morning. I did not see the story. I can't, and I don't remember it back in March, honestly. Well, um, th th this was, th it, there was no reporting on it until back in now. March. Okay. Okay. So I'll look into it. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know the, the um, story. I did hear, I think it was th this individual was having some, some uh, mental health issues. I right. think, is that what true? Okay. I, yeah. I don't really know a lot enough about it to, yeah. to really, to, to, to sell you, but I will certainly, um, I've been a little busy today. I really haven't even looked at a, a, a newspaper much. Just, the, just the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I get news alerts all the freaking time, and I yeah. came across that came up last night. Um, that asked, you know, sure, but um, sure. seeing that 
we're heading into a general election. Mm -hmm. What is your professional thoughts and opinions on how we stand as a state in the way of election security, both in person and mail-in? I think we are in a pretty good spot here in New York State. Um, you know, I know there's been a lot of issue about, uh, you know, the mail-in voting. Um, let's, let's remember that we have been doing absentee voting in New York State or in this country for as long as, uh, you know, probably you or I could, uh, could go back or remember. Right. Uh, so, you know, in New York, I believe we're, we're pretty, we're pretty good about that. I certainly think um, there'll be a, 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 there'll be a rise, there'll be a, an influx of uh, absentee voting, just for the case that, uh, you know, the simple case is where people, um, you know, uh, like, uh, like, like my family, like my aunts, uh, they, they, you know, some of them, um, don't feel uh, that they want to go to out to the to the polls. They haven't been out that much, and um, you know I, I don't um, uh, I don't think there is a in a, an issue or a problem with um, you know you know my um, I don't want to say this. How do I say this? My my uh, my family members that are a little uh, uh, a little older than I am. Um, if yeah. they don't, <laughs> if they don't feel uh, comfortable, I, you, you should never, never bring up age. That's why I, I, I'm steering clear of that. Uh, you know, um, I don't think there's an issue with them um, mail-in voting. I do believe we have made some reforms here in New York State in the last couple of years, um, where I think it actually is going to help out with, uh, you know, the social distancing. We have. Um, early voting now. We have nine days early voting here in, in New York uh, now. We have the option um, now on the uh, absentee application to check um, health-related issues, um, you know, as far as uh, people are having a fear of, 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 of this virus, of COVID. Um, so I think we've taken a lot of the steps necessary. I do believe there'll be an influx of mail-in in, in, in voting, and we're probably going to have to, you know, be uh make sure that's done in a little more secure manner um you know getting those uh getting those issues uh resolved but i think we're pretty good here in new york i, I really do on overall do we do we worry about election security we always should and i and i think we should um continue to be invested and invest in that we we do know from various reports several reports in the 2016 presidential election that there was Russian interference. There's nothing political about that. It's right there um, in, in proof that the, that has been investigated. Um, yeah. So um, we certainly need to uh, uh, be very aware of that. And uh, no, no outside, uh, you know, agency or country should ever have influence in our elections here. Our elections are you know, and our, our right to vote is some of the most sacred. Uh, it is one of the most sacred rights that we have as citizens of this country, and it should mm -hmm. remain that way. And uh, I firmly believe that ever since I was a, a, a little, little kid, um, I believe that uh, we should do, we, we all have our, 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 our right, and we have our obligation to be involved in the process, and the least we can do is vote. Um, for that, and that should be secured at uh, uh, in any way that we can, and we should do that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we go, sure. This, this is one last question. Yep. And I am throwing it out to those in our area that either are running for elected office or are currently in office. Mm -hmm. As you know, back in 1995, Plattsburgh Air Force Base was closed. Um, originally, it was never listed to be closed, but a congressman from New Jersey freaked out because 
his base was on that list. The Brack Commission, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, recently, and this has been over the past couple of years, uh, at the time, the uh, Secretary of the Air Force uh, said that the Air Force is going to um, expand all air wings by 24%. The most recent Defense Authorization Act, within it, it mentions at-risk bases that can be heavily damaged or completely destroyed. Over the past couple of years, we have seen air base, an air base in Florida get taken out by a hurricane, one out west that was heavily damaged from flooding. Um, if, say, a group of people were to get together to work on bringing the Air Force back into our region. And it would take a lot of time, effort, and um, meetings. Um, would that be something that you would be supportive of? Uh, certainly, certainly. And, um, you know, let's go back to 1993. Um, I believe it was 93 when we. Uh, when we received word that Plattsburgh um, would be closing or could be closing, I believe 95 was the date that it actually shuttered. Um, you know, that was a devastating time for our, for our area. And um, mm -hmm. as you know, you know, it was, uh, it was tough. It was tough on, on all of us in, in, in the entire region, the entire North country, because we didn't think we could, we could, we could rebound from that. I will say, um, Plattsburgh, the region, um, with a lot of hard work and with a lot of uh, partner agencies and a lot of people um, working and helping to get uh, uh, the the uh, the reuse of uh, the facilities in the air uh, on the Air Force Base and the housing and and uh, uh, bringing in businesses there that could adapt to it and the airport um, did a wonderful job in doing that and came back in a way that you know we didn't think that that could happen. And there, you know, there were some key figures there that obviously helped in that uh, much like the times we're going through right now. I think it's going to take a Herculean effort um, to, to bring our economy back in New York and in the North country. Um, we're fighting every day to do that. So it's going to be like an air, it, it, this feels like an, you know, an air force base closing. It, it feels like that to, to get these businesses back on track, but certainly if people wanted to discuss that, we have the one of the largest runways. Um, I think it was the it was the largest runway um, uh, in the country at the time. Um, uh, uh, besides uh, the one at Vandenberg, yes. Yep. Yes, and um, certainly we you know there's still the bones there. And if that discussion uh, came up or comes up, um, I would uh, I would be happy and proud to be a part of it for sure. Okay. Um, though. Next time I see Mike Cashman, I'm going to have to talk to him about uh, the development on the corner of New York and uh, Kentucky, Atlas Heights. Okay. They need a scale model of an Atlas missile there. <laughs> okay. okay. You bring that up with them. Yes, I will. <laughs> okay, Jamie. Well, I thank you. I think it was a, it was a pleasure to be a part of this and uh, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, and you have a very nice day. And uh, when the legislative season starts up, I would look forward to talking to you more. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a yep. good one. You too. All right. Bye. Bye.